Becky Hall. I'm the Executive Director at the Nevada Science Center, and I'm here with our Director of Research, Dr. Josh Bondi, and Tonopah Historic uh, Park, Mining Park here in Tonopah, Nevada, um, Jeff Martin, and he is also the Park Guide and Park Host. So before we get started uh, with Dr. Uh, Josh and Jeff, I wanted to tell you a little bit about where we are. So like Ralph said, we're in Tonopah, Nevada at the Historical Mining Park. We're halfway between Vegas and Reno on the 95 and 6. So if you're ever traveling from Vegas to Reno or Reno back to Vegas, we're about halfway in between. So we're here, we're gonna be talking about uh, historical mining and how that mining from the past has also come to the future and our present here um, in Tonopah. So I'll give it to Josh and Jeff and we'll learn more. Thank you, Becky. Hi, everybody, uh, depending on wherever you're at in the world. So uh, for those of you who are not from the United States, we are here in the state of Nevada. So we're about uh, one state to the east of California. Like Becky mentioned, we're about halfway between Las Vegas and Reno on the western or kind of west central part of the state. Uh, we are on historical lands that were traditionally the homes of the Northern Pipe, Southern Pipe, the Numu and the Numu, as well as my tribe, the Western Shoshone or the Newa. So we're here with Jeff. And Jeff's here to share with us the importance of where we're at here in Tonopah and the importance of mining to the, especially the economy of our home state here in Nevada. So Jeff, why don't you tell us what the importance is here of our Tonopah Historic Mining Park? So welcome everybody. Thank, thanks for attending. Um, today I'm going to kind of cover uh, the discovery of Tonopah and it's going to start with a gentleman by the name of Jim Butler. Uh, Jim was what they called a part-time prospector, but he was a full-time rancher, and he lived in an area called Monitor Valley, which is about 70 miles away. Um, in May of 1900, uh, he decided he was going to go prospecting at a place called South Klondike, which is about 10 miles south of where Tonopah sits today. Um, on his way there, he stopped at the springs of Tonopah, which were close by, and during the night, his burrows wandered off, and in the morning, he tracked them right up into this area where we're at, where the story goes, he picked up a rock to throw at one of them, and he found that the rock was unusually heavy. Now, a lot of people don't believe that story, but I tend to think that there's a lot of truth to it. When you look at this whole downslope of the mountain through this whole area right here, there were eight to 10 of these very large outcropping quartz veins and falling off the top and laying everywhere on the ground is what they would call high grade float, silver carrying gold. Jim came up and he gathered up samples and he took them to Klondike where he gave them to the assayer there who took one look at it and said, Jim, this is all garbage. I wouldn't give you a dollar for 10,000 tons of it. Now, we don't know if he was trying to pull one over on Jim or if he just didn't know. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt that he just didn't know. But Jim knew that there was mineralization going on in these veins. So Jim came back through and he gathered up about 80 pounds of it. Um, he packed them back out to Belmont, where he gave them to an associate of his named Tasker Adi. And Tasker sent them out and had them professionally assayed for a share of the claims if it turned out to be anything. And the richest sample of the eight turned out to be, they said, several hundred dollars worth of gold and over a thousand ounces of silver, which is spectacular. Um, Tasker sent an Indian runner to Jim's ranch in Monitor Valley. But Jim was hanging at the time and he didn't want to be bothered. So it took his wife, Belle, several months to convince him. And when she finally convinced him to come out here, they came back a couple months later and started to locate their claims right on the downslope of this mountain here. Uh, while they were out here locating their claims, Jim had his wife, Belle, locate her own. And she located and named what she called the Mispaw. And the Mispaw vein turned out to be the richest and most productive vein in the entire area here. So whenever people come up onto our property to visit or tour, they always want to know, what did they see? What, how did they know there was anything here? So that's where we're going to start. We're going to start with an area right here that is heavy in mineralization. Um, you can see this rock right here. This rock is a volcanic tuff, but running through it are these quartz veins. And when you look close at the quartz veins, you can see the darkness in it. And that's just that heavy mineralization. And um, from time to time, pieces fall off the vein and we come out here and pick them up so people don't walk off with them. But if you look really close at it, you can see this beautiful piece of quartz. You can see the colors in it. And that was always a good indication. Um, you can see these black lines that run through the quartz. 
and that's the silver. And if you hold it just right in the sun, you can actually see some of the gold in it too. So Jim, you have another piece there. Has, uh, oh yeah, so I do have another piece that's even richer than that one, and that's this piece here. And we actually have um, lab work done on this. And if you had one ton of this rock right here, you would have 5.3 ounces of gold and 1,152 ounces of silver per ton. And this is very similar to the original rock that Jim Butler had found. So the Butlers staked out their claims on the property here. And um, with the word of the discovery, of course, you have a lot of people now coming in and looking for their own. But the Butlers told them, look at we've already located these claims. So we already have an idea of what the value of it is and where it's at. But if you want to lease, a 50 foot section of the vein, pay us a 25% royalty, you can keep the rest and we could do it on a handshake. And that's what was done. So the first men in that were working on the mines here or working on these veins were known as the leasers. Um, they would have lived right on the mountainside right here in their tents and they would have just started attacking these large veins. And what we could do is we can take a walk down over to where the large vein is at and get a look at that. So, okay, so uh, a couple of terms I'll let uh, uh, we've used assayers yes that's uh, using chemistry to figure out what's in a rock so those are chemists that professional chemists that were on mine sites and in, in correct labs. yeah yeah so they would do a chemical analysis of the rock and they would give you a pretty accurate value of what is in the rock as far as the specimen or the ma the minerals that go so and there are still professional assayers uh, around especially the state of nevada all the ma major mining companies have them right. yeah and then a vein is a volcanic intrusion, so it's a special type of volcanic rock. Right, and these, these veins were what they would consider epithermal veins. So they were deposited through this um, hot fluid right. and the chemicals within the hot fluid. And once it started to cool and harden, uh, it was what they would say the perfect storm. And these high mineralization veins would form, so. Awesome. So let's just take a short walk right over here. So. Yeah, so here we are, we're standing on what we call the Stoke Bridge. Um, and it, it spans what we know as the Mitzvah Stope or open vein. Um, stope is a mining term. When they are removing the material from the veins, they're stoping the veins. Um, you can kind of get an idea how the first guys in the leasters would just start breaking rock right on the surface of these veins and chasing them in. And when you look at the size of it, it's pretty impressive. And then to think that all this was broken and removed by hand. So they would have had minimal tools, pickaxe, shovel, maybe a chisel and a hammer, and they would just break that rock up. They didn't have a lot of money to purchase dynamite um, or other materials like that. But when you think about every 50 feet being another leaser, there wasn't really a lot of blasting that they could do. As if you weren't coordinated with the other guys on the vein, you could end up blowing somebody right off the vein. So, and, and how deep did they actually dig by hand here? So, these these areas that we're looking at right here, 100 feet, 150 feet, mm -hmm. so um, down just by hand. By hand, yeah. And they did this in about a year's time. And then, of course, um, when the when the leasers were done, um, and the, the the original claims were sold, then the big money came in, and the mining changed. Instead of them chasing these veins from the surface on down, they're now drilling these large mine shafts, like underneath that steel head frame there, straight down and then drifting right over into the vein. And now they're working their way up and letting gravity help them fall the rock. So, so but how deep did the, uh, when the big money came in and they're drilling the big from the head frames down, but how deep were they going with those? Yeah, so the big money came in, the uh, met the big manufacturing or the big mining came in about 1902 and they started um, uh, drilling down by 1907 they were down a thousand feet already so um, that's pretty impressive and when you think about all the um, the tunnels and the workings that's below this entire area they say anywhere from 300 miles to possibly 500 miles um, it doesn't seem like it's possible but when you think about the in the size of the Tonopah mining district, it's 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 feasible because it's it's a pretty large district. So, um, 
it's an amazing view to stand up here and to look down into the into the bridge. So or this bridge that we're standing over goes hundreds of feet down. It's pretty cool. Yeah, and something else that, that's really kind of neat to see when you're standing and looking at these open stopes or these open veins is the, the, the color of the rock on the face. Take a look. And it's just kind of the evidence of what I was talking about with the heavy mineralization. Um, so what colors do you see? Like what indicate like that there was yeah so you see you see that the rust color and that's that's just uh um iron staining and then you, you see some of that black rock and that's probably what they would call a um, manganese oxide um and then there's a lot of the colored rhyolite through here and um it was just it's just the evidence of of really rich really rich deposits so rhyolite is a special type of geologic rock that forms from uh, volcanic eruptions that have lots of quartz in them. So that tends to be, the, that's the host rock here is the- is Yeah, the, the host rock or the country rock or whatever they want to refer to it as, but it's, it's really common uh, throughout this entire area here, so. So one of the really important parts about the story here at Tonopah is that mining drives technological and scientific innovations. Yes. So when there's money to be had, you know, people develop ways to get at it, right? Oh, absolutely. You know, and in the early days, in the early days, um, you could see just the beginning of the of the mining on the veins. Uh, there was no train or rail service here until almost 1905. So that tells you for almost five years, most everything that was being hauled out was being hauled out on wagons. The closest railhead was probably about 60 miles northwest of here. So it would go in the early days, it was probably close to six days on a wagon, and then it would be put onto a train and they could haul it over into California to be processed at the mills. Right. Um, and then when, of course, the big money came in, their goal was to have their own processing here. Um, in 1906, they built the first cyanide processing mill about 14 miles out at a, at a place that they called Miller's. Um, and it was a 100 stamp, uh, one of the first cyanide plants in the area. When I say cyanide, they were using the cyanide to actually uh, extract the silver and the gold from that crushed rock. And what the cyanide does, it would attach itself to the silver and the gold. So when they drain the cyanide off, it would bring it with it. And then there's some other processes that to uh, separate it all out and, and uh, bring it to ingots. And that's still a, that's still a process. That it is still a process. Yeah, still yeah. So that's today. that's one of the things is, you know, cyanide. They started uh, experimenting with the cyanide in the late 1880s, and um, by 1900 they thought they had it down. But with the type of the rock that was here, it was high in in uh, sulfur and, and silicas. Um, it made a a really good processing agent, and um, they went from the old amalgamation. 52 percent return to in the low 90s using the cyanide so right. it made sense to to use that you know and it, people go oh cyanide well it's it was at a low percentage you know it's all dangerous but <laughs> they knew what they were doing so right yeah um and what's really interesting is that that mining has had a number of these big chemistry breakthroughs like especially metallurgy which is the study of how metals behave Yes. as well as engineering. So a lot of these big engineering feats that were done here in Tonopah have actually been developed and are still used in modern mining today. Correct, correct. You know, and um, something to think about with mining is um, just about everything that you use in in your life today is mine, you know. Right. Um, if it's not grown on a farm, it has to come from There somewhere. it is. If it, I have a bumper sticker that says, if it's not grown, it's mine. So, right. you know, from toothpaste to soap to, to uh, just about everything else. And then there's the use that they use um, in technology, you know, um, circuit boards, gold and silver, um, these electric vehicles that they're making, there's, there's gonna be all kinds of need for a lot of that, a lot of that mineral, so. And just like in the early 1900s where mining was a major economic driving force for the state of Nevada, for anywhere outside of the Las Vegas area, mining is still a predominant industry across our state. It employs a lot of people, yeah. tens of thousands of people are dependent 
in the state of Nevada on their jobs from the mine, still on the mining industry. Right. You know, you think of the the large mines that are close by to Tonopah, um, 50 miles out is Round Mountain Gold. It is one of the larger open pit gold mines. Been out there for a long time. They employ quite a few people. So that's part of our economy. Uh, to the southwest of us is Silver Peak, Nevada, the lithium mines, you know, that's something that's really growing right now. And uh, in our area right here, we just had some exploratory drilling done. And I guess there are some lithium deposits in the area. So um, when you have mining, when you have a mining town like Tonopah, there's always going to be the peaks and valleys. It's, it's going to be a roller coaster ride, you know. You're going to ride that high, and then all of a sudden it's going to stop, and you're going to drop back down, and then something else is going to come up, and you're going to ride that high, and it's just that way, and it's been that way here for 122 so years. So speaking now. of those uh, those peaks and highs and lows, what was Tonopah like over 100 years ago? So now we, we you know, outsiders kind of think of it as a sleepy historic mining town. Right. But what was it so, back then? Yeah, so it was a, it was a bustling town. Um, so maybe we can sp span and see some of the city right here because we're yeah, in a great viewpoint. If you point. look down, you see the two, the two five-story buildings right there, the Mispah Hotel and the Belvada. And those are two of the first five-story buildings in Nevada. Of course, there were some that was six stories prior to that, but didn't last long. They burnt down Virginia City area. But uh, two of the first five stories in Nevada. Uh, the, the center of town was a bustling town. Uh, Tonopah's population uh, in the early days, in, in excess of 10,000 people. Uh, 26 miles south of Tonopah was Goldfield, dis discovered two years after. And Tonopah and Goldfield actually became kind of a competition to become San Francisco of the Nevada deserts, high society. And they were here and opera houses and theaters. And uh, it, you just wouldn't think of it, but it was. It was an amazing place to be. You know, uh, Robert McCracken wrote a book about Tonopah and the title of the book was The Greatest, the Richest and the Best Mining Camp in the World. And I, from what I've read and the, some of the photos that I see, I'd have to agree that it was an amazing place to be, you know. And then uh, we're really fortunate that we still have all this on this property, you know, and that we're able to share it with people. Our whole goal is we want people to come into this property and just go, who knew? Right. You know, who knew? Because this was one of the most significant silver discoveries not just in nevada but in the united states maybe even the world you know when you think of the amount of silver that came out of the mines here it's in excess of 175 million ounces of silver and over 2 million ounces of gold and if you think of the values of that in today's money that's 4 billion in silver and just under 4 billion in gold so it's it's um it, it's amazing. All right here where we're standing. All right here where we're standing. We're standing above what was known as the hot spot or underneath us, 200 feet is is these this l giant load of silver that they just attacked and removed and attacked and removed. And, and it's just, uh, it's really amazing to think about, you know, in the back in the day, they would hold the miner's ball below ground in one of those big open chambers where they had removed this material from. And I could just, today, I think that would just be really amazing to be able to do that again. Right. Candlelit dinner, orchestra dancing, stuff like that. I think it would all be underground. Just, <laughs> all underground, yeah. So, so um, and then, like I said, we're really fortunate that this was all left behind. And I'm gonna say, um, the, mine, the Tonopah Mining Company had a very long life, um, 1902 to 1948. So, um, of course, like we talked about, peaks and valleys there were times of not much going on and then there were times that it would boom again or excel again but um that 40 year 48 year period 46 year period was just um that's why all this stuff is still here you know right. we're fortunate you know we're really fortunate so how many acres are we again we are sitting on 113 acres and it consists of the silver top mine yeah. which is let's back point, over let's here. point out some of these great things behind yeah, that's us the silver top and the silver top was also one of jim's original claims and it was a great producer and if you turn back around and behind me that's the mitzvah that was the big that was the biggest producer of all and you can see the large hoist house with the large steel head frame one of the first in the west and um 
heavy lifting, the height of the head frame, the size of the motors in the building are actually what determine its capacity. And they talk about had a seven ton capacity. Oh, wow. Can you imagine pulling seven tons of rock out of the ground at a time? It's amazing. And people. And people, yeah, absolutely. And then up on the side of the mountain, you can just see the top of the, the Desert Queen. And that's one of the most recognizable head frames uh, in the West. And it has this uh, or, or storage bin on the front of it that's actually in the shape of the state of Nevada. So when you come to visit the park, we'll get you up there and you can look around. It's quite amazing. So, and then the uh, North Stars up on the side of the mountain, the Montana Tonopah, those are competing companies, but the Desert Queen, the Silvertop and the Mitzvah were all part of Jim Butler's original eight claims and all turned into the Tonopah Mining Company. Thank you so, so much. Jeff. You're welcome. You're and, welcome. And so I, I think we have time, Ralph. If you want to, if we've got questions, absolutely, we're happy to... we certainly have questions. Uh, so first of all, thank you, Jeff, and everyone at the Nevada Science Center. Thank you, everybody at the Geological Society of Nevada, and definitely the Tonopah Historic Mining Park. I would be remiss to uh, not met to uh, not mention that they have a very special event. If you are in the Tonopah area or traveling through this summer, they have the Mining Park Summer Soiree, which is gonna be held on June 11th this year. It's a fundraiser for the foundation that they have. And uh, it's free park access, live music and dancing, free barbecue dinner. So those who are traveling through uh, the great state of Nevada. Uh, we have plenty of questions, one of which uh, comes from one of our friends in Italy and they wanted to know, when was the last time mining was done in Tonopah? So the last time mining was done directly on this property would have been 1948. Um, and uh, 48 was the last, was the last year. Uh, there has been um, uh, exploratory or sampling done of the big dumps. Um, it, some of the numbers were, were, were worthwhile but nothing ever really happened over it. And that was back in the eighties, so. Yeah, so this is still an area because of the geology. Geologists and mining geologists are still very interested in it because just because they're done right here doesn't mean there's not other similar geological situations where there might be gold or silver nearby. Correct, yeah. And there's a and lot of exploratory drilling going on in the area now, so. That's, you know, and, and that you pointed out a lot of interesting stuff. Some of our younger folk, they wanted to know, can you talk about if mining, what were the safety issues when it came to mining back in the, during those times? Yeah, so unfortunately, there wasn't any real um, safety protocols, um, the, especially when the big money came in. The owners and the operators, they knew that um, um, you could be replaced. It's just like anything. Um, until uh, 1911 in the Belmont mine here in Tonopah, there was a major mine fire. And after that mine fire, uh, the state of Nevada and the, the mining, they, they got interested in uh, mine safety. Uh, so that was kind of the, the beginning of setting up protocols and, and, uh, and rules and regulations to uh, keep miners safe. So, so just in the United States, we have an organization called OSHA, which takes care of people, make sure people are safe at work. In the United States, there's a parallel one called MSHA, MSHA yes. which is specific to mining safety. Yeah. So the, the, the rules and regulations of 120 years ago compared to today are, are completely different and thankfully so. Yeah, it didn't sound like a fun time to work. Um, so oh, hard work. Yeah, we had a, a question from one of our students. They want to know which city came first when it came to mining cities in Nevada, uh, Virginia City or Tonopah? Virginia City came first, and Virginia City, uh, 1859 is when they first started mining in Virginia City, and by 1864, that's when um, Nevada became a state. That's why we're known as the Battleborn State or the Silver State. Um, when the mining started to slow down in Virginia City uh, in the late 1800s, um, people were leaving. There wasn't a lot going on, and then Jim Butler discovered Tonopah and that's our claim to fame is we're the silver that saved the state so with the discovery of the silver here people started coming back into the state to work it's the best thing for an economy is people working two years after Tonopah Goldfield was discovered two years after that the Beatty and Rhyolite area was discovered so that four to five year period 
in the central Nevada area is what really got the state going again. So we're thankful for that. And that's, you know, we're fortunate to have that. So absolutely. Yeah. Well, we're thankful for you and your organization. We feel fortunate that you and Josh and Becky are helping educate and inspire so many kids who have taken an interest in the history of mining in our great state here in Nevada. Uh, one of our students uh, overseas, they want to know what was used to extract with the old amalgamation. Actually, I think that comes from a fellow expert. So uh, do you guys know that term or no? I think they're talking about how how did they extract the ore? Yeah, can you explain a little bit about that? So um, the yeah the the mercury works similar to the way the cyanide did, um, it, as it would uh, it would attach itself to the silver and the gold, um, and then it would hold on to it. And when they would bring the mercury off, they would have to process the mercury to separate the silver and the gold out, and it was a Kind of a nasty, nasty um, process. Uh, and not as efficient either, right? It wasn't as efficient. Um, and uh, mercury, it's you know, that's there's a lot of problems with mercury. Um, it never goes away, you yes. know. And uh, uh, if you think about some of the areas where they were using the mercury to process, it's still in some of the water sources. So, yeah, definitely not not good stuff. Yeah. But, uh, and that's actually uh, kind of ties into what uh, it's, uh, we have a question from Reno, Nevada, and it's Wooster High School. And uh, she wanted to know if you could touch on that, like the long-term effects. Is there anything else outside of the mercury usage that have long-term effects on the environment that we're kind of dealing with now? So there, there's always going to be um, a long-term effect, especially from any of the early mining that was done 120 years ago but over over time they've gotten uh much smarter about it and uh, have implemented regulations when it comes to mining and processing and uh, it's so regulated right now and um i'm gonna say it's it's pretty safe uh to to do this to do the mining um because we need it we need it so um where there's a will, there's always a way, and there's always a safe way. And, you know, in the early days, there wasn't this. They just did it. It was just done. You know, there wasn't much thought about it, but things have changed since then, and we're, we're pretty fortunate for that. The state's pretty fortunate for that. So. You, you can't even open the mine right now unless you have a plan for after the mine for how your right. environment is right. take care of the effects of it. Yeah. And, and that's... That's great that we have a lot of wonderful society, uh, organizations and societies uh, like we have Geological Society of Nevada and various entities and a lot of mining companies within the state of Nevada that think about 10 steps ahead about how, how to keep our uh, environment safe. Um, so uh, the final question, the kids wanted to know where can they learn more about um, if they wanted to go into being uh, professionally working mines when they, when they grow up, what would you guys recommend? Yeah, so what I would recommend, uh, depending on where you live, the location that you live in, do a little bit of research on what, what might be in the area. And for people or kids that live in Nevada, you your your whole state is a, is a classroom just go outside and start looking at the different mountains and the different colors that you see in the mountains and then start researching and you'll learn be in there and how to look for it so and one of the really important parts about mining and why it's such a driving force in the economy of especially the northern part of nevada is that you can work in the mines as a diesel operator a diesel mechanic an engineer uh, scientists, so chemists, physicists, geologists, all work in the mining industry. So anywhere from being an equipment operator to going and separating the gold and cyanide in a, in a lab, uh, it covers every single discipline that you can think of. So uh, if you want to work in a mine, uh, like Jeff said, research what's around you. If you're in Nevada, get out the hills, whack some rocks with your with your hammer. Yeah, break rocks. And uh, you know, get outdoors. I, I think that's one of the funnest parts about being a geologist in my career. Right, like, right. To be outside in places like this. Right? Plus, plus you can make a, a good day's wage. Absolutely. You get paid pretty well <laughs> to, to do mining. So, 
That's that's wonderful. So we hear that it's getting windy there. Uh, we'll kind of wrap it up. But before we go, we'll mention again, if you are traveling through or if you are a school near the Tonopah area, um, definitely check out their, uh, their wonderful uh, Tonopah Historic Mining Park. And uh, they do they usually charge either nothing or $1 per child. If you're coming through, definitely check that out. Definitely check out the Nevada Science Center's website at nevadasciencecenter.org for future events. There's a lot of uh, Fossil Friday chats and a lot of more virtual field trips on the horizon. So before we let you go, guys, I'm going to go ahead and unmute everybody so we can all say thank you. Josh, is there anything you'd like to add before we go? Just thank you to the Geological Society of Nevada for helping uh, get us out here today and for sponsoring this virtual field trip. Absolutely. And thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Becky. Ralph. Yeah. Ralph. yeah, no problem. I think uh, let's have Jeff tell us a little bit more about the tours that they offer here. Please. Yeah, we offer, um, of course, group tours. Any school that wants to go up, come up and do a, a, a field trip, an actual field trip, we're, we're more than welcome to bring them on and, and show them around on the property. But what we're known for is our Polaris tours or side-by-side -side tours and we can take up to five people at a time and they range from $12 to $35 so um, talk to your parents and that's them to and that's all weathers either hot summers yes, or cold we can, winters we have, we have uh, open and enclosed Polaris's we could do we could do a Polaris tour and a blizzard if you wanted to so, uh, <laughs> give us a call and we can schedule it at any time so um, it's kind of the way to see the property and it's a great time a lot of fun